Welcome to Audiobook da Morgan. Today's reading is Uts, chapter 38. But before we start, please subscribe on my channel and press the button to activate notifications. Chapter 38 The Museum, a grandioso edifice from the good old days of Franz Joseph, had been named after the Emperor Rudolf to commemorate his passion for the decorative arts. Along the front facade, there were sculptured bars reliefs representing various crafts, gem cutting, weaving, glass blowing. A pair of grimy sphinxes sat guard over the entrance. Burdocks were sprouting through cracks in the steps. The museum was shut for various reasons, as it had been shut in 67. Only one room on the ground floor was open for temporary exhibitions. The current show was called The Modern Chair, with student copies after Rivalci e Montaigne and a display of stacking chairs in fiberglass. At the reception desk, I asked to speak to the curator. Prague is hardly a stone's throw, culturally, from Dresden. I knew that if I posed as an expert on mice and porcelain, they would soon call my bluff. So I cooked up a likely towel. I was an historian of the Napoleon Rococo and was writing a paper on the Commedia del arch figurinas of the Capaccio Monchi factory. I'd once seen Mr. Ut's lovely group, the Spaghetti Eater. Was there any way of knowing where it was? A subdued female voice on the end of the line murmured, I will come down. I had to wait ten minutes before a homely, middle-aged woman stepped from the lift. Her head was wrapped in a deep lilac scarf and there was a wen on her chin. She drew back her lips in a covert smile. It would be better, she said in English, if we went outside. We strolled along the embankment of the Vlatava. The day was cold and drizzly and the clouds seemed to touch the spire of St. Vita's Cathedral. It was one of the worst summers on record. Mallard drakes were chasing ducks in the shallows. A man was fishing from an inflatable rubber dinghy moored in midstream, with the kittiwakes wheeling around him. Tell me, I broke the silence, why is your museum always shut? What do you think? She let out a quick, throaty laugh to keep the people out. She gave a furtive glance over her shoulder and asked, You have known Mr. Utz? I knew him, I replied. Not well. I once spent an evening with him. He showed me the collection. When was that? In 1967. Oh, I see. She shook her head forlornly. Before our tragedy. Yes, I said. I always wondered what became of the porcelain. She winced. She took half a step forward, a full step sideways, and leaned against the balustrade, apparently uncertain how to phrase her next question. Do I think correctly that you know the market of mice and porcelains in Western Europe and America? I don't, I said. Then you are not a collector? No. Or a dealer? Certainly not. Then you have not come to Prague to buy pieces. God forbid. My answer seemed to disappoint her. I had a presentiment she was going to offer to sell me Utz porcelains. She exhaled a deep breath before continuing. Can you tell me, she asked, have pieces from Utz collection been sold in the West? I don't believe so. A month or so earlier, I had called on Dr. Maris Frankfurter in New York in his overstuffed apartment at Twitter with mice and birds. Find me the Utz collection, he had said, and we will make ourselves really rich. No, I said to the creator, if anyone knew, it would be Utz's old dealer friend, Dr. Frankfurter. He said it was a total mystery. Oh, I see. She looked down at the water. 
So you know Dr. Frankfurter? I've met him. Yes, she sighed. It is also a mystery to us. How is that? She shuddered and fumbled with a knot of a scarf. All those beautiful pieces. They have gone. How would you say it? Vanished. Vanished? I could hear the air whistling through my teeth. Vanished. After his death or before? We do not know. Until 1973, the year of Utsi's stroke, the museum officials were in the habit of paying routine calls on him to check that the collection was intact. The visit seemed to amuse him, especially when one or other of the curators brought a puzzling piece of porcelain on which to test his expertise. But in July of that year, his right arm was paralysed. He agreed to sign a paper confirming that, on his death, the collection would go to the state. He also agreed to import a second collection from Switzerland. With the previsio that, since the visits now distressed him terribly, they would leave him thereafter in peace. The director of the museum, a humane man, consented. 267 objects of porcelain were given special clearance through the customs and were delivered to Yutsi's apartment. The funeral, as we know, began at 8am on March 10th, 1974. Although there was some confusion over the timing of the arrangements, as a result, the director and three of his staff missed the church service and had the burial after and were 30 minutes late for breakfast at the Hotel Bristol. Two days later, when they kept their appointment at number 5 at Siroca Street, no one answered the bell. In exasperation, they called for a man to pick the lock. The shelves were bare. The furniture was in place, even the bric-a-brac in the bedroom, but not a single piece of porcelain could be found, only dust marks where the porcelains had been and marks on the carpet where the animals from the Japanese palace had stood. And the servant, I asked, surely she must know. But we do not believe her story, 